Good morning. <laughs> That's good. Right on cue. Man, awesome worship. Thank you, guys. Oh, my gosh. I'm feeling that. Yeah. It's Christmas time in the city. I'm not ready. But I'll get there. I'll be there. This takes a little while. Amen. Good, good, dynamic, powerful worship. Thank you guys for that. We are spoiled. Oh my goodness. Heaven and Nature Sing is our sermon series that we're starting over the next few weeks. Um, I hope you enjoy it. There was a, uh, an English pastor, minister, um, his name was Isaac Watt, Watts, yes. And uh, he wrote the lyrics to a song that was based on Psalms 98 years ago. Middle, Middlesex, England. And uh, we sing it, we sung it today, Joy to the World. The Lord has come, let earth receive her king. I love that. Let every heart prepare him room. Make room. Let heaven and nature sing. 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 What a great song. And we, saw, we sang some of that today. I love Christmas time. I love singing at Christmas. And the coming Jesus, Savior, Messiah. As he comes, causes the whole earth, heaven and earth, to worship God, to worship him as our Savior, as our Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And so we celebrate that coming birth of Jesus this Christmas. And a lot of people sang about it in the story. There's lots of songs of Christmas. Zachariah sang about it. The angels sang about it. Mary had her song about it. Simeon, we're going to talk about today, had his song of prophecy about the Christ child. Now, that's pretty cool. You're pretty talented if you can prophesy and sing at the same time. You're gifted, all right, I'm telling you. So Simeon was gifted. If you can do both of those in one, that's amazing uh, how God might would use you. So we're going to talk about that, that song of worship as we prepare room for Christ. We break out in worship for him. Okay? And the thing about Simeon that I love about this guy is, in this story, is that he demonstrates a true heart of worship. So how do we do that? How do we make room like Simeon did for this movement of God and Jesus in our own lives. Well, let's look at it. Luke chapter 2, verse 25. It says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and he praised God, saying and prophesying, Sovereign Lord, you have promised. You may now dismiss your servant in peace for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of the people of Israel. He prophesied. Wow. What a powerful verse at Christmas time. Simeon, the man that patiently waited on God. So how do we prepare room in our heart, how do we develop the life of worship that we should have for Jesus in our own lives? How do we do that? I think that's the question. Let's talk about 
Simeon being prepared to be truly a worshiper of God. First of all, first of all, one of the ways that we demonstrate a true heart of worship is by living with a deep commitment to God. You see, Simeon already had a deep commitment to God that prepared his heart. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout, verse 25 told us. Righteous and devout. He was patiently waiting on the Messiah. In fact, God had revealed to him that he would see the Savior before he ever dies. He's just like hanging on. He's older, up in his years, hanging on, just wanting to see that promise before he passes on. And he goes to the temple, and there the family of Jesus, Mary and Joseph, they come to the temple, and there he sees what he's been waiting for, the Savior. He meets the Savior through the family, and he breaks out in this song of worship as he takes that baby Jesus into his arms and he begins to sing and he begins to prophesy and he begins to worship God that this was the Savior that he's been waiting on. Isn't that cool? What a great story. His worship is simply an outward reaction to what was on the inside of his heart. That's what his worship was. Just, it was just what was on the inside. He'd been living with a deep commitment to God, walking in a relationship with the Lord, waiting on the movement of the Lord in his life. And that led him to have a heart that was prepared to make room to worship the baby Jesus or to worship the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior, the Messiah. And we should live that way. We should be sure that we're making room. We should have this deep, devout commitment to God because the scripture says that he was righteous. He lived life right. He emphasized the importance to live life rightly the way that God would have us to live life. Everything in this world will tempt you to do otherwise. But yet Simeon stood strong. That's what it means to follow Jesus. That's how you do it. You stand up. You stand for that that is right. So he lived right. He lived as God would have him to live he lived as God would create him to live. He dealt with people the way that God would have him deal with people. He loved people and dealt with them in a way that God would have him to deal that with love and with honor. And he dealt with situations and the temptations of life the way God would have him live with those. He was righteous before God. And God encourages us to live that same way. He gets the nod of the Lord. Well done, my good and faithful servant. I had a, a government teacher in my school, Stoic, Dr. Cravens. I thought about government and working in politics one time, Ben. But God saved me from that. And so, <laughs> thank God I'm not doing that. And, uh, but I'll never forget when I graduated, he, he was so stoic. And I remember that graduating and getting in my degree from Howard Payne University, which none of my children will go to. And uh, I can't, can't help that. And, and so uh, I'll never forget walking across the stage and I'll never forget catching Dr. Craven's eyes. And he looks at me in his stoic way and just, just nods. Good, good job. Well done. <laughs> What's it like to get the nod of the Lord, you know, <laughs> when you walk across? And he says, yeah, good job. See, Simeon was righteous. He was just. He lived in the way that God would want him to live. And he made room in his heart to be able to worship the Christ the way that God would want him to worship the Christ. So he was righteous and he was devout. He was a devout, God-fearing he was uh, reverent towards the Lord. He feared the Lord. Uh, and he, he, he lived the way that God would want him to live. And he respected the Lord the way that God would want us to respect the Lord. He did, he, he did all he could to never be an offense to the things of God. He made that priority. I just don't want to offend God. I, I have reverence for him. And so I want to live in every way I can to be sure I'm not offending him. He's my Lord. And not to offend Jesus. He's my 
Savior. So he lived always landing on the side of God. Now, isn't that faith in Jesus? I mean, if he saves me and he goes to the cross, he dies for my sin, and I believe in him, and I receive him as my Savior, wouldn't I at least want to always be sure that I stood on his side? Yeah, stand up with him. He's the Savior. He's the Lord. So I would be devout in my faith, that God wants us to be devout in our faith, always standing on his side, making room in our heart so that we could what? We could worship the Lord. This is Simeon. So he teaches us the importance of living with a deep commitment to God in our life every day. Number two, another way that, that Simeon demonstrates to us how that we can live uh, with an open heart to worship is by trusting in the good news of Jesus in every way. Luke, the end of verse 25. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel to take place. He was waiting for the Messiah. He was waiting for Jesus. He trusted the good news of Christ. He didn't just believe it, but he committed his life to it because he trusted it. This is the good news. It's true. It's real. I believe it. I, I embrace it. I live it out. He trusted that. No matter what he faced in life, no matter which direction things went, he always trusted that and he waited on that consolation of Israel. He waited on that relief. Consolation, that's the idea, is that relief of the burden of sin for Israel. He waited on that comforting of Israel. He waited on that sending of the Savior, the Messiah, to set them free from sin. And he waited on that. He banked on that. He stood on the good news of Christ coming to be the Messiah, the Savior. He believed it. He trusted it. He lived it out. He was consistent in his life in following the things of Christ. Jesus is the epitome of gospel. He's the epitome of good news. Okay? Jesus didn't just bring the good news. He is the good news. It's him in person. He's it. He doesn't just deliver it. He breaks it. Now, a lot of you guys, this Christmas, Christmas for some people is more than just Christmas time. Sometimes it's a homecoming. Sometimes it's loved ones coming back home. And some of you may have someone in your house has been gone for a while. You may have someone that maybe serves in the military and maybe they're overseas. And at Christmas time, they're probably going to get a chance to come home. Many times this will happen. And, these, and, and some of our servants that serve our country will come home. And with them, they'll bring a gift. And they'll bring a gift to give to you. And you won't even care what the gift is because most of all, you just want to see them. Right? See, that's Jesus. Oh, yeah, he brings the gift of salvation, but not only that, he is the gift. When he shows up, it's a gift. I receive it. I embrace it. I, I take it. It's powerful in my life. And so I just can't wait to see him show up. Okay? So Simeon represents God's people as they're anticipating the coming Messiah. We just can't wait for him to show up. But not just for God's people, the entire world. I love that. It says in there, uh, even for the Gentile. It's a revelation to the Gentile. It's a new revelation. And it's the glory of God's people of Israel. Wow. What a great story. God's people anticipating the God movement. See, God's people, as God's people, we can't wait to see God move, right? We love it to see the Lord move in different people's lives. Lives change. Uh, last week we had, uh, even, even though it was kind of a Thanksgiving weekend, we had actually six brand new guest family groups from this city. And I said, like, oh, good, God, move in their lives. I want to see that. I want to see you work in that. You know, we love, we love to celebrate God's victories in the lives of people as God's believers. We love that. We, we get excited about it. Yesterday, I watched way too much college football. I overdid it. I overfed uh, on that. But, uh, and, and I spent too much time with that but so but I, I love when whenever teams come away with this really powerful victory uh i didn't see any of this this yesterday but you see it sometimes many times whenever that team has this great victory 
the fans of that team, the supporters of that team will storm the field after the game. Have you seen this? You've seen this, right, in games? When people storm the field and they're like, all right, let's do something. Hey, let's tear down the goalpost. They'll tear the goalpost down or something, you know, but they, they storm the field. They're celebrating the victory, you know. I think sometimes God's people just want to storm the field, you know, and just say, oh, what a victory in God. Let's storm the field. Let's tear something down. Well, let's don't do that. Let's build something up, okay? Uh, and, and so I think we just want to storm the field. And I think this Simeon and the movement of God was so powerful that God's people were just ready to storm the field. It just juiced them up that now the Savior, the Messiah has come. It's exactly the same way that the church should feel every time that we come in and we worship God. We should just storm the field in victory to say God's going to do it again. I think God's people just love that. I think they just love the celebration. They love the victory. We trust so much in the good news of Jesus. We like to see it work over and over and over again in the lives of people. And so Simeon demonstrates this true heart of worship by living in his deep commitment to God, by trusting in the gospel and the good news of Jesus, and also by leaning into the full presence of the Holy Spirit. This is interesting. Verse 25 and then now through 26. And the Holy Spirit was on him, talking about Simeon. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Hmm. He, he leaned <clears throat> into the presence of the Holy Spirit and so should we. He leans into that. OK, um, the desire to lean into the presence of the spirit is an act of worship. It's a praise to God. And Simeon lived in God's presence constantly. Well, that's interesting. Remember, we're coming out of the Old Testament and we're right on the verge of the launch of the new. Now, in the Old Testament, the presence of God tended to exist in places where God would allow it to exist, but only for short periods of time. It might be in a cloud, might be in the temple, might be on the holy seat, might be leading his people. It might be on certain people and in their lives, but only for maybe a period of time. But yet, here as we come upon the New Testament, when there's going to be a new launching of the Spirit, where every believer everywhere at any time can live in the presence of the Spirit we find Simeon consistently living with the Spirit on him. God's preparing for the time that's coming. He's preparing for the Pentecost that will come and the releasing of the presence of God to be with all believers at all times. Wow. And so he, he leans into that in his life. And I think that God wants us to lean into that now that it's available to us. We should lean into it. When you get excited spiritually, you lean into the presence of God. I was in, I was in Nigeria some years back and I was preaching a little revival there in a city the size of Victoria, but there were a million people that lived there. So they're all crammed into this little city. Can you imagine a million people? I wouldn't drive Navarro at that point. And uh, so we were preaching the message there and, and uh, I was there with another pastor and the pastor was a singer and he stood up and he sang this old spiritual song. And we were in a room this size with about 700 people in it. Okay. That'd be nice. <laughs> and, um, and so... God moves and the people in that room get excited. And they start moving in, leaning into the presence of the Lord, or leaning towards us, you know, you know, thinking that's where it might be, but not, but you know, obviously not. And they're leaning and begin to come in and begin to press in. And I thought we were going to be crushed to death. I thought we weren't coming out of there. I really did. There was only one. They didn't have multiple exits. Like we, there was no fire code, obviously. And, um, uh, I, I really thought we may not get out of there. And the biggest Nigerian I'd ever met, who I hadn't seen till this time, so I'm not convinced he wasn't an angel, stepped in and said, move. 
and the crowd parted. And we walked out of there safely. It scared me a little bit, though. But they were, they were just pressing into God, a place that was void of anything good except for the presence of Jesus. They were responding to the gospel message in such a powerful way. It was so life-changing, and the presence of the Spirit was so real that in their worship, they began to press in to the presence of the Holy Spirit in their lives. That's cool. And God wants us to lean in to the Spirit. Well, I feel so dry spiritually, Pastor. I'm not sure this Christian stuff's working for me. Hey, lean in. Lean into the Spirit. Lean into the presence of God. He wants to fill you with all the fullness that you could possibly have in your life. But he won't do it unless you lean into it. So he demonstrates this heart of worship by living this commitment you know, to God by trusting in the good news of Jesus, by leaning into the presence of the Holy Spirit. And another thing that we learn in this passage of Scripture is that he also grows in his worship by waiting on the sustaining promises of God's word. Verse 30 through 32. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. He's waited. Simeon has been waiting and now he's standing on the coming promises of the word of God. I demonstrate a heart of worship when I wait on the promises of God's word to be fulfilled in my life patiently. I wait. Oh, there's a lot of other roads I could go down, a lot of other things I could get involved in. But it's important that I wait on the movement of God's word and stand on those promises of God. Did you know that in Jesus' coming to earth and his life on earth, that he fulfilled over 300 prophecies found in the Old Testament? Is that crazy? 300 prophecies about the coming Jesus Christ Messiah he fulfilled in his lifetime here on earth. 300. Wow. There's no prophetic prediction even close to that. Not remotely close. Has anything ever been predicted with that kind of uh, multiplicity and that kind of effectiveness and that kind of truth? We've never, we don't find it anywhere in history. There's been no other prediction like that. 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfills. If God fulfills 300 prophecies about Jesus, then there's no promise in this Bible that he won't fulfill for you. You can trust it. You can believe it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's true. It's full. It's, it's God's word. We can stand on it. You remember the old song that we used to sing years ago in the church? Standing on the promises. You ever sung that? You know, standing, I'm standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Right? Yeah, I even learned how to do this to it. Yeah. <laughs> standing on the promises. We would sing that. Standing on the promises of God. The scripture says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he always gets back up. And he always gets back up because he's standing on the promises of God. When you fall, just get back up. Where do you stand? Stand on the promises. Stand in Christ. Stand in Jesus. Make a stand for him. If you're going to be a believer, you will not get out of this world not making a stand for God somewhere. So gut it up and do it. God's people shouldn't be chickens. God's people should be strong, faithful, trustworthy. They should believe. Our faith is all about believing what God says in his word. Trusting that. Every time God's people get together and every time we come in here and we gather and we start singing the promises of God, we're a testimony of the Savior, the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time. It's our worship. Our worship is 
standing on these sustaining promises of God's word. If you haven't need, needed the promises of God's word yet in your life, you will someday. Because you'll come to a crossroad, you'll come to a place, you'll come to a challenge. That the only way that you'll make it through it is by standing on the promises of God. It's the only way. You won't come out of this world free from sin to live in eternal heaven without standing on the promises of God. It won't happen. You'll need it. It's God's word. And we come today, this Christmas. It's easy to get really busy. It's a lot going on. Shifts gears. Let every heart make room. Make room. Prepare itself. Prepare space for heaven and nature to sing. If there's anything we should do this Christmas, we should just make room for God. Lord, I got room for you. In fact, I want to know you better than I've ever known you before. I want to come to you in a way I've never come to you before, God. I want you to fill me up. I want to live with a deep commitment to you, God. I want to trust in this gospel. I want to lean into your Holy Spirit, God. I want to stand on all of your promises, Lord. I just want to spiritually be stronger than I've ever been this year. And so I give my life to you. And I worship you. And I thank you. Boy, Simeon, what a great example of how we can open our hearts up and live strong in our relationship with God. Let's bow our heads together for prayer. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, maybe you need to make a commitment in one of these areas today. Maybe you need to say, Lord, give me a deeper conviction to live for you better. Maybe you need to say, Lord, help me be better committed to the gospel and to living that out and sharing that. God, help me press into the presence of your spirit in a new, fresh way. God, help me stand on your promises in my circumstances. Whatever it is, why don't you make that your prayer right now to God? You can pray for the Lord to begin to do that in your life right now. Just a few seconds here where we stop and we reflect in our hearts. We think about the commitment we might need to make. Make that your prayer right now. However you need to do that. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for today. So good to come into your house and worship and sing and just open our hearts up to you. God, thank you for the example that we looked at today in the scripture. God, begin to work that in our own lives. Prepare our hearts to worship you better. Help us to live deeply committed to God. Help us to trust the good news of Jesus. Help us to lean into the fullness of your spirit and your presence and sustain us through your promises. God, we trust you. We believe you. We love you. Help us to live for you, and we promise we'll give you the glory for every great thing that happens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys.